look like they're very quite brilliant, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> Apart from the uh, Chelsea and Bruno, what a Thursday, I think. It was. How long have you been making movies on Thursday? <laughs> 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 Chopped into doing a couple of them. So <laughs> especially when I'm I'm probably going to watch this appeal as soon as the Euro Cup is on this weekend and pull out the last minute to go and have a thought. That's what I did. Sky the Lambs. Sky the Lambs, yeah. yeah. That awful thing that sit on a manager of Luton radio set for an yeah. hour and a half. Yeah. I did that in May. It was all listed. Yeah. That I've, I've fallen on the last few minutes. Just to try and keep up with, with people that do come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you always get somebody who has a busy bazaar section. Um, yeah. Is that yeah. you? I'm very interested. You are. Anyone wants it, grab it. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have caffeine for Lent, so. Oh, uh, have you? Yeah. Are you trying to yeah. get seventeen headaches? That's what you're doing. Thursday, Thursday yeah. is quite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's gonna be. I feel there's quite a lot of benefit from it. Yeah. It's probably good that I, I like coffee, so I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. Some days, so I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of like um, uh, But you're so used to it that you don't realise what what powers you're supposed to carry. Yeah. Oh, my grandparents used to have a farm in a um, place called. Are you doing work at uh, uh, Mark's, 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 Mark's Cross, is it? No. no. They used to live in Shelwood Gate for a while after they retired. Oh, right. The farm, they lived in Shelwood Gate, which is not that far from the school. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody else, no? Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for today's keynote panel session, What Is It Going to Take to Keep the Lights On? My name is Ellen Bennett. I'm the editor of Utility Week, um, and I'm joined here today by our panellists, Keith McLean, Director of Policy and Research at SSE, Gaynor Hartnell, consultant and former chief executive of the Renewable Energy Association, Tom Greatrex, the Shadow Energy Mi Minister, and Lawrence Slade, Deputy Chief Executive of Energy UK. 
We all know that energy is one of the biggest issues out there at the moment. And I think last week that was just confirmed um, with the launch of the Competition and Markets Authority um, inquiry. But we really wanted for today's session to cut through some of the negative publicity and the scare stories. We all know that actually we need to keep the lights on for this decade and beyond. And today I'd like to get to the heart of what it's actually going to take to do that. So before we get into the debate, I'd like to ask each of our panellists to briefly open by giving us a couple of thoughts in answer to the question, what is it going to take to keep the lights on? Keith, can I ask you to start? Okay, thanks very much, Ellen. Um, I, I think, first of all, it is important to say that we, we need to avoid the scaremongering about this particular topic. And even the concept of the lights going out is somewhat misleading because the sorts of challenges that we face, uh, and, and there are no doubt challenges um, that, that we need to gri get to grips with, but they're not the sort that uh, means that the, that the lights suddenly go out. That only usually happens if there's some sort of catastrophic failure. And what we would really be talking about is, uh, as National Grid are doing at the moment, the, the, the managed uh, switching off or reduction of uh, demand uh, in, in industry. But, but having said that, you don't want industry, particularly if we're going into uh, a period of recovery, to necessarily be throttling back on production for those sorts of reasons. And so it's really important that we move ahead with the tools that are uh, currently being designed, and some of which should already really be being used, um, in order to encourage new capacity to be built. And in particular, we need to move ahead with the, the new capacity mechanism which is, desi uh, is designed to uh, start with auctions uh, at the end of the year. Um, and in the meantime, we need to work very hard to make sure that we don't lose any more of the existing plant, um, either a plant that might close or a plant that might go into mothballs. And therefore, it's really important that National Grid and Ofgem use the tool, the interim tool that they've got, which is the supplemental balancing reserve and that for both of those, um, we make sure that they come forward in a timely fashion, sufficient volume um, and, and a commitment to how it's going to be funded. So we need a, a proper debate about that so that we understand how it's going to be funded, not only how much it's going to cost, but how those costs are going to be spread uh, amongst the different users, because we're all fundamentally aware about the issues of affordability at the moment. So we need to have that debate now as we're preparing to move forward. We need to press the button on these tools. If we do that, we should be in a much stronger position um, than, than we are. And, uh, and as I say, we, we should be focusing on making that work rather than scaremongering about what might happen if we don't. Thanks, Keith. Gaynor? Thanks, um, Ellen. <clears throat> well, I mean, Keith will know obviously far more about the actual decisions that are made um, in terms of keeping plants open, shutting plants, etc. Um, I mean, and it's good to hear him say, you know, let's not have the, um, you know, too much alarmism in this debate, really. I mean, I, I must say, when I first went into energy some, I don't know, 20, 20 or so years ago, and I first had the term capacity margin explained to me, um, this is the kind of amount of extra plant that you need to, in order to be confident you can carry on operating the system. It was first explained, as, you know, this is, this is the percentage, about 25%, and this is what you want to kind of aim to keep going. Um, and then it, was, it went down to 18% in 2010, and I, I hear that the latest prediction, it will go down to 2% in 2016 and 2018. So it does sound to me to be rather near the wire. Um, and, and I think there is also quite an unusually difficult investment climate at the moment, um, and a few things have contributed to that. I think saying there's going to be a capacity mechanism in the first place, from the moment that's said, then everyone is going to then wait for that to happen um, in order to know what the rules are, etc. So doing that, and then, um, and then there have been some issues with the kind of exactly how that mechanism will work, and then you know, concerns over it possibly being delayed. And then the carbon price floor, I mean, which I think was a pretty ineffective policy to start with, but to introduce it and then within you know, a year later to actually say we're now going to freeze it, again, that doesn't help. Um, and I think allowing, just having this incredibly politicised um, you know, debate about energy at the moment just doesn't help either. And, and um, EMR is another thing, but I'll, we'll probably come on to that in a minute. Thanks, Gaynor. Tom? 
Um, well, the, the debate on energy is politicised because uh, it's an issue of concern to the public, and that is reflected back through the political debate, and it's also at a time of significant change, both with EMR and uh, including the capacity market, but also with the um, investment uh, requirements that are needed. But I mean, I'll just start by saying that the point that Keith made at the very start is very important about the way in which we think about this in terms of uh, lights going out and lights not going out. It's sometimes um, politicians accused of, are accused often of being alarmist, perhaps sometimes with, um, uh, with some reason behind it. But the uh, response from, um, uh, it was, I think it was Ian Peters from British Gas at a fringe meeting at Labour Party conference saying, a short-term price freeze will make the lights go out is probably the root of some of the uh, some of the discussion we're having here today. And I think people need to be very careful about the way in which they think about uh, what the consequences of potential changes are. But in terms of what we need to do, I think um, we've been, from the Labour perspective, been very clear around our uh, support for the capacity mechanism as part of the EMR reforms and that we do need to get on with that. There are obviously concerns around the European issues on some of that. The balancing reserve, again, agree with Keith about um, you know, getting on with these things. Um, there are obviously a lot of detail which is still not yet absolutely known and that needs to be clarified as soon as is possible so people can therefore make those decisions. Um, and then for the medium and longer term, it needs to be about having a sense of purpose and direction in energy policy, which is about being clear about what it is our objectives are and how we're going to reach those objectives. That won't deal with the uh, tightening of capacity which is um, set out in the various scenarios that everyone's seen in the next couple of years, but it will deal with what happens after that and it's crucial that we keep our focus on that because the longer we delay decisions and put them off, the harder they become and the more expensive they become, which isn't good for consumers or the industry. Thanks, Tom. Lawrence? There's a danger of the panel being in violent agreement uh, <laughs> <laughs> at this rate. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made. It's certainly a very complicated scenario that we have at the moment. Um, and I think you know, some things make very good headlines. And one of the benefits of good headlines is that they actually put things into focus and they bring attention to bear on them. And I think energy is one of those industries that's needed this focus for quite some time. So I think this debate overall is to be welcomed. I think. We are under time pressures, though, um, and as everyone has inferred already, we can't have any delays. You know, we need to stick to committed timescales because we are a long-term industry. You can't magic up um, capacity in the future. So planning takes a long time. Investment planning takes a long time. So programs have got to be kept on side. Massively welcome what Tom has said around the support for current programs. We need not just cross-party consensus, we need multi-parliamentary term planning and agreement. From an investment point of view, you need to know what's happening to your investment returns, not just in five years, but in 10 and 15 years. That's the kind of timescales we have to play with in this industry. I think also one thing that hasn't come across yet that from my side, and I always tend to lean more towards the supply side in these things, is the consumer. And there's a, there's a couple of elements here. We have to be honest with consumers. We have to make our industry more transparent. We have to regain the trust of consumers to understand the scale of investment we need to make and why that investment is needed across the scene going forward. Furthermore, there is a generation side of the argument. There's also a demand side of the argument and we need to spend more time and highlight the prospective savings that are available on an effective demand side that doesn't use scaremongering, that doesn't use, dare I say it, Daily Mail headlines, but actually allows a sensible debate around how industry and commercial customers can make a contribution to this, but also how all of us can make a, um, a contribution to keeping the lights on, if you will, by effective energy efficiency. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by quantifying the, the scale of the problem. We, we hear a lot about the capacity crunch and the margin, but some of the estimates actually differ, don't they? You've got Ofgem saying one thing, DEX saying another. Um, Keith, what, what, what's your view on, on you know, how big a risk is it? Well, I, I think the, the problem is that the numbers are quite difficult to deal with nowadays. In, in the good old days where um, pretty much every type of generation provided firm capacity, you could measure how much you had and how much of that was over and above what you needed and it was pretty much available at any time. 
but moving to um, a more renewables in the system means that a different measure now uh, needs to be used because um, let's just use some numbers. Uh, um, peak demand is somewhere between 55 and 60 gigawatts on, on a cold uh, winter's day. Um, we're actually probably going to have 80, 90 or 100 gigawatts of uh, generating capacity. Uh, but not all of that is generating capacity that we can rely on all of the time. So nowadays people talk about the derated margin and that's the one that um, Gainer was referring to. So if you, if you subtract off what you're not sure is going to be there, then the margin does get quite tight. Uh, if you imagine a very cold winter day with peak demand um, at the same time as you have an anticyclone over the whole of the northwest of Europe for two weeks when the wind's not blowing and there's not very much sun at that time of year either. So that, that's the, 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 the critical period and it's only for a short, shortage period of time. Those are the sorts of scenarios that we're, we're having to work, work very hard to, to manage and um, uh, uh, the National Grid does that very well. So November the 4th last year, uh, uh, December the 12th the year before, were the tightest days and each of those we came within about half a gigawatt of needing to turn off some demand but didn't, didn't quite get there. So the challenge for winter 15 and winter 16 will be making sure that we maintain that sort of margin and, uh, and manage our ways through that. But that does require um, some doing because a, a lot more plant will have closed in by 15 and by 16. Um, and uh, so the, the challenge there is, as Lawrence said, on the one hand managing the demand side and on the other side trying to get some of the mothball plant back out of mothballs again, um, which is quite a, a lengthy and, and expensive business. And, and how, how important is it to, to bring back some of that old capacity now, Gaynor? To bring back mothballed capacity? Yeah. I don't know, I'm really not the expert on that, but I would think it would depend on why it's being mothballed. I mean, somebody who's probably been involved in thinking about mothballing or not would be it's a better person to ask. because it, 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 it uh, is loss-making. You, you, you have to spend more on buying gas and then running a gas station than you make by generating electricity. But and you keep a, it in a state that you could then resurrect it fairly swiftly, do you no, not? No, because when you mothball it, you uh, don't have any staff anymore. You take the thing apart, uh, you put it into preservation. So you're talking quite often six to 12 months to re-employ staff, retrain staff, get it all up, up, up and running again, get your maintenance contracts in place, bring back the spare parts you might have used for another power station. So it's six to 12 months, and that's why we can't hang around in terms of getting stuff back for this winter. And how do you make that, um, how do you make that pay as a business, Keith? Um, it will only pay um, if the fixed costs are covered either by the capacity payment from the capacity mechanism or in the interim from this thing called SBR, Supplemental Balancing Reserve, where National Grid will pay you uh, to keep the plant open so that on that cold day you will be able to, to, to run it. Um, it's as simple as that. You know, if, if those fixed costs aren't being paid, then you don't employ the staff, you don't have the, um, the, the thing warmed up, ready to go. Um, so that's really the challenge with, with those two mechanisms. I'm interested in how the affordability agenda kind of plays off with, with security of supply, because obviously bringing back mothboard capacity, um, developing new technologies, all, all puts money on the energy bill. And as we know, that's, that's something that the public doesn't want to accept at the moment. So, Tom, I'm interested in, in your views. How do you square that circle? Well, it's, um, it's a triangle you're trying to square in a way, really, which is, um, yes, the issues around uh, concern about affordability and, and uh, adding to bills, and as well as the issue around the requirement for renewed and new capacity um, for reasons of security of supply um, and then the, the sort of commitments we have in terms of carbon as well and so it's a it, uh, those are the you know that's the parameters we're working in. and I, I mean I think about this um, a lot as you'd imagine and uh, I think actually the the reasons why um, and there's a point that um, that Lawrence made around transparency is so important is because uh, people don't trust their energy suppliers mostly um, and that's something which all of the big suppliers have recognised and the small suppliers have worked out that that 
perhaps gives them a way into uh, the market or increasing their market share is, uh, is by capitalising on that. Um, and there's only one way of dealing with that properly, and that's real transparency, because you cannot, I think that's a prerequisite for what we're talking about today and the longer term investment that needs to happen rather than an inhibitor of that investment. Because without people being clear about why they're paying, what they're paying, you cannot then have uh, an objective debate and discussion about um, the need for the investment and why that investment's needed. Because we should also remember that uh, when we get into, as we sometimes do, technology versus technology arguments in that context, that there isn't a cheap way of doing this. Uh, whichever way it happens, because of the age of a lot of our capacity that needs to be replaced, even after allowing for lifetime extensions, even after allowing for uh, potentially um, de-mothballing mothball plant, and that is not without its risks, depending on how long things have been mothballed and, and to what, uh, what's, what standard they've been mothballed. Um, you know, even allowing for all of that, there is a significant gap that needs to be addressed in a relatively short period of time. And so the affordability issue is tied into transparency. And I think that's why the reforms that we've suggested and set out in our green paper are important, not just um, for, uh, you know, for political purposes, but also to, uh, uh, for consumers, but also for the investment agenda, which is um, getting more and more pressing the longer that we go on with, um, with, a, with the, uh, the very low levels of investment we've had in the recent past. I'm interested in, in how you talk about how trust and transparency are key. And I wonder if you think that customers understood the bill better and it was more transparent but remained the same or higher, would that be acceptable? Well, there are, there's, there are a number of issues there. One is about whether they understand the bill, but that's, then there's transparency in the way in which the market works. And it's all very well for people to understand the bill and for the bills to be clearer, and they are uh, gradually improving in terms of being a bit more accurate in terms of descriptors, but there's still an issue of comparability which people find hard to do. Um, but that only ever works if you've got transparency in the other part of it, which is, you know, what is the relationship between the generation and supply parts of the business? Where is the profit being made? And is that profit acceptable and is at an acceptable level? And the sense that people have, and I'm not saying this has happened in all cases, but it's certainly a feeling that many people have, which is that excess or excessive profits are being made in one part of the business. Um, the figures are being uh, calibrated in a certain way to suggest a loss is made in the retail supply of the business, but you know prices are so the consumers are going up. That needs to be properly sorted because if it's not, you know you'll never get beyond this beyond this sort of debate, which ends up being quite a circular debate. And as to whether then um, will people accept it um, if the uh, if that still means prices are going up? Well, that I think is a is a good prompt for uh, for people to think more carefully and about the way in which they use energy, because it's about you know if you're using less um, by using it more wisely, not necessarily by being cold in winter, but by having uh, better insulated homes or by uh, thinking more about which devices you leave on and when. All of those things can make an impact, but it's hard for them to make an impact unless people see there's some benefit from it, and that's tied up with, both with issues around potential you know, time of use tariffs and, uh, and actually a tangible saving, but also a sense that this is something where they're not being ripped off somewhere else. Because as long as people think they're being ripped off somewhere else, the incentive to do anything is, is limited. I think what, what Tom's saying there is, I would agree with the whole transparency part, but I think you need to look at it across the entire scene. And it's actually quite a, a, a vibrant market increasingly so with a number of independent generators outside of the vertically integrated. and something like 24 domestic supply companies so there, there is a, this wealth of companies coming into the market now so we shouldn't always paint such a negative picture however and there's always a but or an if in this industry I think affordability is a key argument here and a key issue because one thing we haven't done for the, probably the last decade actually is really explain to consumers what we're trying to achieve it's almost like we signed up to something in the good times and committed ourselves to, to signing these things up, and I think only four MPs were against the, uh, the act, Tom? So, yeah, some, not, yeah. <laughs> something okay. of, of that ilk. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the, the point being is we need to be a little bit more pragmatic about our approach to how we're doing this, and a little bit, little bit of flex coming in. So we all agree around core elements, but we have to actually bring people with us. And I think over the past decade, we haven't always had consumers at the table when we're looking at these things and when we're committing to costs. I don't think anyone is arguing against the fact that we must transition to a low carbon future. But I think the issue is, have we actually brought our customers with us 
do they actually understand what we're trying to achieve, what the end goal is, and have we been really honest about how much this is going to cost them? I think we've got to be very, very careful when we say, by doing this, by 2020 or by 2030, your bills will be cheaper. I don't think that's necessarily the correct. They may be cheaper compared to what they would have been if we had stuck with a high carbon environment. And you can always flick back and look at uh, the car industry and look at how that's effectively been revolutionized over the last 20 years in terms of energy efficiency and look at the economic markers that were put in place in that industry to actually change behavior and how people have bought into this over time. So I think we've got to be really careful here about how we address our customers. And again, I said at the start, that's not just domestic customers. We've got some massive industries, particularly in this part of the country, and we need to make sure we're looking after our high intensive users. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with plenty of that. And one of the other things that I've have got a problem with the um, the way that energy policy is being run is that it's such a complicated policy landscape and so many of the different elements interact in, in a way that actually increases costs. You really do end up in a situation where you're decarbonising in a not very cost-effective kind of way. Even just looking within hmm. renewables, within the renewables technologies, um, there is not the drive to kind of maximise the contribution that the lower cost renewables can make. And instead, there's a big emphasis on the, on the higher cost renewables. There's a lot of government picking winners and not le letting the market um, play out. And, and so many things interact. And there has been quite a backlash, I would say, against um, renewables and a lot of um, misapprehension amongst the public. You know, they'll, they'll say things like, we've got, to, we've got to bring energy costs down. We've got to do nuclear, for example. Um, and all this renewables and energy efficiency is too expensive. Um, I mean, I have sympathy it's being done in a in a way that's more expensive than it needs to be, but there is just so much ignorance out there um, and so much not very sensible policy making, I would suggest. Um, just a couple of points on, on that. I think on renewables, we need to understand that renewables also play a part in security of, of supply, but it's security of fuel supply. Because the more we generate from renewables, the less we're dependent on imported gas and oil. And I think, if nothing else, the uh, troubles in Ukraine have probably helped refocus on the need for us to have independent sources of fuel. So renewables aren't, as I said before, um, they don't play a strong role in terms of capacity, but they play an enormous role in reducing the amount of oil and gas that we're going to need. Just a, 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 also going back to something that Gaynor said about the complexity of uh, how all of this uh, 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 the, in the interactions are. Um, one of the benefits of the capacity mechanism should be that it will actually lower the energy cost because if all of the fixed costs have been paid for uh, through the capacity mechanism, the energy cost that is then needed over and above that is simply what will be needed on the day to pay for the, uh, the gas and, and, and the people on that day rather than um, the, 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 the main fixed costs of the plant. So uh, for, for any given level of margin, if the capacity mechanism and auctions are run properly, what we should see is just a redistribution of the overall price to more fixed payment um, going to the, the, the generator, but less of a variable payment uh, for, uh, based on the, the, the energy price. We, we, we've been touching um, on EMR, and let's let's talk about that and talk about investment, um, because I think with the announcement of the CMA, CMA referral last week um, and, and EMR taking its time to play out, there's a sense that perhaps uh, the UK has shut up shop to energy investment for the next 18 months. Lawrence, do you think that's fair? Um, I think it's probably caused more concern amongst investment communities. Um, I think one of the problems you have these days is that we compete for investment on a global market. And I think the risk that we have to be very cognizant of is that whilst there is still investment there and there is still capital available, we compete with that from other countries or with other countries around the world. So when you're going back to your boards, if they're one of the overseas boards, um, not looking at Keith in this regard, um, you have to be aware of the fact that there are other investment opportunities that the board may also be considering. So that, that is an issue. However, I think there's also um, 
where there's threats, if you like, there's also opportunities. And in conversations with a lot of the smaller players in the market, um, they're actually seeing quite a lot of opportunity coming in. And if you actually get things right, and as I said earlier, if actually things like the capacity mechanism come on time and we don't get any further delays, they are actually looking at fairly significant investments at the lower end of the market. But those are quite small scale generation investments that are great for bringing in new entrants into the market, which is what we all want. But as I'm sure Keith will testify, you also need significant base load capacity and you've got to have this intermittent backup capacity that does, that's where the big bucks are and that's where the serious risks are in terms of, I want to know where my long-term certainty is. Yeah, just back up that, I don't think the CMA referral actually changes any of the basic yeah. facts. Yeah. We're already in a hiatus and have been pretty yeah. much, there's not been a new gas plant decision, sorry, bar one, or, or any other thermal plant decisions made since 2009. So we know we're in a hiatus, that's why a lot of EMR is being done, that's why now that we've decided what the tools are that we're going to use, that we actually need to actually get, get on with it and put them uh, in, in place uh, to do what it is that they've been designed to do, because we desperately need to get that um, new build going, uh, because more and more plant is, uh, is, is due to close, the economics of coal are becoming increasingly unattractive as we go into 2016 and beyond. So we have to look at, at um, further closures. So new build is essential, capacity mechanism really has to run uh, so that we get that certainty and clarity that, new, that that plant is going to be there in 2018. Tom, I think some um, parts of, of the market would, would uh, say that Labour played a, a fairly big part in um, decreasing the attractiveness of investing in, in UK energy. What, what would you say to that? Well, the, um, there has been a, a drop-off of investment before September 2013, quite a significant drop-off in terms of uh, levels of investment in both uh, uh, in low carbon. As Keith said, there's been, a, other than Carrington, in terms of... Uh, thermal plant there's been not very much happening uh, for a considerable period of time so I don't think that um, that particularly stands up uh, to much scrutiny that, that that view which is sometimes put um, I think it's not surprising though because you know when you think about the uh, EMR process and the reason for EMR in the first place which um, I always uh, say it's not uh, not anything to be ashamed of the process of the moving towards EMR started before the last general election um, because it was well recognized the uh, requirement need for a better way of of, of trying to uh, stimulate the investment we needed in renewing uh, capacity and particularly in terms of low carbon and the investment profile of that is different from uh, from thermal plant as well so that that's the reason for having a, a system of long-term contracts over a period of time and we are in the process we have well, whilst the primary legislation has gone through Parliament the detail in terms of uh, some of the operation is still uh, to be concluded and to be the regulations to go through and it's not surprising therefore that that has uh, that has had an impact in terms of uh, in terms of investment decisions so I would say I spend a lot of time and have done particularly in the last six months a lot of time with investors um, uh, from a range of different places um, UK overseas pension funds others you know a whole range of different investors in talking about these issues and the two things that they always say they need are for the policy to be clear, and we are, I think, I hope, getting towards that. We've still got some way to go in terms of the detail, but that is that we're getting towards that point where that will be clear. And then a sense of direction uh, and commitment from government of whatever political stripe. And as I think Lawrence referred to long-term decisions, the important thing about uh, the energy industry and the energy sector and those investments are they are likely to be decisions which will have an impact way beyond the lifetime of one, two, probably even three governments. So um, a sense of long-term direction is therefore important, and that's something which isn't helped by uh, contradictory messages from within the same government and sometimes from within the same government department. It's also a reason why um, we think we should have an energy security board, which is partly about ensuring there is um, an authoritative source of long-term thinking to guide government so that whilst government may still make the decisions, that they're properly informed by long-term considerations because it's always very tempting for politicians and ministers to only have their horizons to uh, not just necessarily the next day or next week's headlines but towards the next election not much beyond that and we need to really change that uh, particularly in relation to the energy sector and that's something 
um, which I think you know there's a range of, of ways of, of trying to do an energy security board which we proposed is just one way of, of trying to achieve that. Um, Lawrence, you talked about how um, the, the capacity market would work if it starts on time and if there are no further delays. That's a big if. How, how confident are you that, that that's going to happen? I think we have to be confident. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've made some notes a couple of days ago and uh, said it's not as simple as that, but if you can remove all the ifs and buts, then we're heading down the right road. Um, and I think that's the case. I don't think you'll speak to anybody um, in government or in the industry that doesn't underestimate the importance of delivering these things on time now. Um, I think that commitment's there. We've just got to make it happen. So, confident. I'll hold, I'm the I'll hold you here. to that. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, what, what, what does it mean for suppliers if capacity auctions don't start on time? Um, well, I think the, the last thing that we need over and above the uncertainty there is at the moment is a frenetic debate about um, problems with power supply and industry going, uh, you know, being, being switched off. I, I think that would be disastrous. Um, it just sets the whole wrong tone. Um, it, uh, and the, you know, it's, diffi it's difficult to see how um, or the, 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 the various different, you know, government would get blamed, the, the, the energy companies would get blamed, Ofgem would get blamed, you know, amongst all the finger pointing, that isn't a good basis then to actually get into a, an Olympic type uh, build because, you know, that, that we really need to be seeing it in that, in that light that, uh, you know, bef bef before um, uh, other stations close, we need new ones to come uh, online. So we, we should be doing that. And Tom's uh, energy security board is is an interesting idea. I think if if we can get a body that generally does work pretty independently and isn't afraid to say it's my it's it's, it's uh, uh, what it's thinking like the the, the climate change committee, I think that could work. Unfortunately, there's a whole uh, trail of um, quangos and bodies that have been set up and advisory bodies to do things in the past. Uh, that are either no longer there or, or, or um, nobody pays any attention to any, anymore. So we absolutely need to make sure that it had teeth, that it was given that independence. In, you know, however uncomfortable it is, and we see currently quite often with the Climate Change Committee that there is a, a tension between government and, the, and, mm. and what it is that they're doing. Um, if, if we are brave enough uh, it, to, to set up a body like that, I think it would be very helpful. It, one of the criticisms of, of EMR, particularly as it, as it kind of plays out, is, is that it favours certain technologies over others. Um, Gaynor, with your kind of renewable industry hat on, can, can you talk a little about that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, in a way, EMR, the whole, the whole idea is really, it's, it's, it's government deciding right down to the level on, on a plant-by-plant -plant basis which projects it wants to actually see come forward and which ones it doesn't. Um, and that's all very well if, you, if it's a nationalised industry because government should be able to play that role and it can play that role. It's difficult to play that role when it's operating remotely um, and sort of providing the instructions. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's a very complex challenge. It means that there's, you know, there's reams of people working in deck trying to get, get this right and micromanage every, every aspect of it. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure that the... I'm, I think there are some very basic things that concern me about the, um, the, the, the CFD, uh, the transition from renewables obligation to CFDs. I, I don't have a problem with the CFD itself. I, I can see there's quite a lot of merit in that idea. M what concerns me more is the actual process of deciding um, who, who gets allocated a CFD. The problem with it is that a project developer will have to... Um, invest an awful lot of money up front without knowing that they will be able to get a CFD. They've got to, they've got to, they can only bid into the process if they've got planning permission secured and a, and a grid um, connection, you know, paid, paid for and, and, and in, you know, in their grasp and not being able to take away from them, which is, you know, you know hundreds of thousands of pounds and, and not something you'd want to gamble on if you don't get um, your CFD at the end of the day. So at the same time as competition is, is being sort of 
encouraged and looked for at the supply end of, of the market? Are these mechanisms driving out competition, driving out the smaller players from well, the generation side? Um, I mean, the, the thing about competition and renewables is that it's, it's something that the industry hasn't really wanted to talk about um, in this whole EMR debate. And I think that actually the indus- industry's been wrong about that. I think it's almost assumed that competition per se is a bad thing. But, I mean, competition can be done in a, in a sensible and sensitive way. It's just the idea now of having competition between technologies. So whatever goes into the competing pot, whatever the most expensive technology is, is going to have a problem. And it doesn't have to be done like that, um, necessarily. But just the fact that the industry wasn't prepared to talk about it, it's then been landed with a, a kind of competitive mechanism that is not going to work very well for it. I, I, I think we've got the, the ridiculous contradiction in terms at the moment that um, the, if we're looking for the low-cost renewables, we should be doing onshore wind. But everybody says, oh, no, we don't actually like it onshore, so we're going to do it offshore, and we'll, but, but we're not now prepared to pay the extra cost that uh, is needed to, to, to do it offshore. I think there has to be a sensible debate again about what it is that we're trying to do and if we are wanting to take a more expensive route then how that is going to be paid for. And just to back up Gainer's point, if we're going to if you go to an auction, a successful uh, auction or a successful tender has a characteristic called a disappointed bidder. So that's the bidder who's gone to the table, put down his ante and has lost it. Now If you are doing that with a few million pounds on an onshore wind farm, that might be an acceptable risk, and you might have enough projects in the pipeline that you'll take a a, a few losses uh, and uh, the the winds. But if you're looking at a big offshore wind farm, and where you're the price of getting to that table, the ante that you're putting down is over 100 million pounds, I can tell you, you don't want to be disappointed. And if your board uh, uh, quite sensibly says there's a realistic chance that you might be the disappointed bidder going into that, they're just not going to sign off that sort of risk uh, capital in the first place. So we need to find a better way of finding uh, uh, auctionable items or stages of projects rather than the whole thing. Uh, Otherwise, we will never be able to get any of the bigger projects away. Um, And uh, that's regardless of whether they're, they're, they're overall economic or not. It's just that the amount of capital at risk is simply too great. And is, is that about um, developers working together and sharing the risk and, and joining No, uh, the, the, the Danes um, have a, a simple approach on their offshore wind that the state says, right, we want somebody to develop these projects, so they, they tender for people to do the development, and then once they've got a project that's been developed that's got planning permission, they then tender that to the market for somebody to, um, to, to construct and operate it. So you're not taking a risk, you're not, you're, you're, you're not having to spend all of that development money, that's the, something that the, the, uh, the, the state has taken on and only done once. Um, and, the, 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 and that's then been auctioned off um, at, at a later stage. So we need to look at it a, a little bit more uh, 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 imaginatively. Is that something you think the government would be open to? Uh, not at the moment, because they're, t- 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 they're intent on, on getting through what they've got at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the, we, we made a big announcement on cutting back our offshore wind developments from four and a half gigawatts to 375 megawatts last week on the basis that we cannot take that risk going forward. We've seen RWE pulling out, E.ON have pulled out, Scottish Power have pulled out, Centrica have pulled out. It's just simply not a risk that uh, we can manage. Maybe some of the state-owned companies like Dong and Statoil and Statcraft can, um, but it, it, it's a slightly bizarre scenario that we're creating a construct in the UK uh, that feeds the um, that, that can only be met by the, the state owns in other countries. And that and that's talking about big projects and yeah. big companies. I mean, this this goes down to smaller projects in smaller companies. You know, a lot of the renewable sector comprises SMEs and, and they won't be able to f- afford to actually go through the upfront investments for much smaller projects. So it's, you know, it's right across the um, piece, as they say. At every level, yeah. Okay, I'm going to open up to questions from the floor now. There's one in the corner over here. Can, can you tell us your name and where you're from, please, sir? Hello? Hello? Yeah. 
Um, my name's Ken Neal. Uh, I'm a building design and environmental consultant from uh, Berkshire. Um, we've heard a lot about the economics of things, um, but the big problem is the pseudoscience of economics doesn't take any account of ecosystem services. And so the, the whole system um, is out of kilter and, and skewed. Uh, so this is why we've got a lot of the problems with investment. It takes no account of, um, of the uh, environmental problems caused by a lot of the systems. Not sure what the question was. I said, did, did you guys hear it? But, well, um, how how can how can we um, how can we make a judgment between different different systems when the the, the pseudo science of economics is broken, and, and that's the, that's what we use to to um, to differentiate between different systems. How, how can how can that work? Well, I. I I think a, you know, an, an, an obvious example of that, if I've understood the point correctly, is the uh, desire in the UK, Europe, or even worldwide to try and price carbon effectively, because we haven't been doing that. And at the moment, we compare the costs of uh, fossil fuel-fired energy uh, with renewables, and renewables are more expensive, but that's because we're not paying the polluting, pollution costs of carbon. So. That needs to be properly fed into the, 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 the system, I would, I would absolutely agree. Um, and to an extent, I think a lot of the interventions in the energy market are trying to deal with some of the market failures like carbon, uh, but it does make it all quite, quite complicated and markets um, you know, price in complexity and risk. Um, so I think we need to get a good balance between trying to do all of that correctly um, but do it in a way that doesn't make, that doesn't add, add unnecessary extra cost over and above that. But I, I, I don't uh, disagree with the sentiment of the point at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree. What you, what you really are aiming for is a situation where all of all of the costs to society and, and the environment are all factored into to pricing and, and in a straightforward, you know, simple policy that everyone understands and isn't changed. Um, every five minutes, which is, you know, a nice aspiration, but we're we're a long way from it. But I don't disagree; it is the right way to go. Um, all, all I would say in that, though, is it isn't just about carbon because um, we haven't even started getting carbon right. But beyond that, it's not just about carbon. You do have other things, um, you know, which which renewables assist with as well as um, uh, carbon reduction. And that's just one of the things I slightly fear is that um, you know we, we focus just we won the argument to get renewables kind of on the agenda and being developed, you know, some you know, decade or so ago uh, or two. Um, and now everyone's thinking just about carbon, but it's, you know, there's an awful lot of other things, f fuel security, employment creation, rural diversity, mm. loads of other things which, which renewables benefit and some of the other technologies don't really, um, you know, help in a positive way towards. Hi, yeah, I'm Frank Ingalls with the, um, basically I do trees, I'm with the Forestry Commission. You, you seem to be making um, environmental decisions based on economics, which I agree is completely broken. Um, what, in terms of the industry and in terms of, well, the government, what are you doing about community distributive energies, electronic smart grids where people can generate their own electricity in the place, store it, need to research into things like hydrogen fuel storage, etc. And do it at a community level. People will buy into that because they'll own it. Why are you still doing this top-down sort of elite type of energy marketing on fossil fuels which by definition have to run out? What, you know, what is your long-term thinking here? Because I'm not worried about me. I'll, I'll, I'll die soon. I'm talking about my, my kid and my kids' kids. You know, we really are behind the eight ball on this and there doesn't seem to be anybody talking about anything other than the cost of it. Wait, you see the cost of not doing it. I think uh, there is a, a vision. Um, I think, unfortunately, we are still an analog industry at uh, the meter point, shall we say. Uh, there is a massive program just getting underway to digitalize uh, our market. And that's at, uh, from the meter angle, but also in terms of upgrading grids and bringing in smart grids, etc. 
it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over a period of years. But there is a vision there for community energy projects. There are a lot of projects in place at the moment. Uh, renewable heat's just around the corner. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We keep on being told anyway. Um, and those things will start making a difference. But we're talking five to ten years before you're really there. So that, that vision is there. I think a word of caution from my perspective, though, at the moment I can't see a world in which we don't need significant forms of base load capacity in addition to the, the community energy projects. Can I? Yes, I agree. You won't, uh, I can't disagree with that. At a time when you're looking for investment and you've got your fingers crossed and there's a lot of hope going on, and I understand you guys are probably all on the same page, don't get me wrong, this isn't a criticism, but you need to wake up and you need to do it now. We're, we're heading for 1.34 trillion in debt in this country, right? We're talking about paying deficits down and all the rest of it. it it's not going to matter because mm. in 10, 15 years' time, we won't be able to afford cheap or expensive energy unless you guys get your act together and start using everybody else in the community to help you get through this problem and tell the truth about what energy should have cost us, not what it cost us historically because it was never priced correctly. We'll, we'll sign up to that because, hey, you know, we all enjoyed the good times too. Okay. Um, just, just a point of information. The government published in, in towards the end of January this community energy strategy, um, which, uh, I mean, it's a, it's 170 pages odd, and, and it, there are 600, 650 community energy groups. So there is an appetite for that amongst um, uh, amongst the population. I mean, there's there's a lot that needs to be done to facilitate the, the, these kind of projects. But I, I do agree, you do need both. You need, you, it's great to have community buy-in. There's, there's money there that, you know, we need investment and, and any investor, whether it's a community investor or um, institutional investor, whatever, they, they've all got to be encouraged in. Um, there's a long way to go. There's a lot of the things that facilitate that need, needs to be sorted out. Things like license light and all the rest of it, metering, getting smarter in all sorts of ways. I mean, I'm not saying that government document's going to do it. I'm really not. But, um, you know, we're involved in some, in some small element of, of, of part of what um, they envisage. But it is on the agenda for the first time, really, I think. You look utterly unconvinced. Yeah, I must say. Okay, thanks. So we're gonna gonna move on now. Um, I think we've got a question down here at the front. Somebody with the mic at the back. So, gentleman uh, right at the back. No. Go on, sir. Hi, Tony Miller. I'm involved in supporting schools uh, in helping them to get a better understanding of uh, sustainability. Um, Tom made a valid point in in uh, terms of um, uh, using energy wisely, but it just strikes me being involved with the schools that they really don't know what they should be doing to use energy wisely and um, there, there could be some mileage in debt getting together with the department for education and putting forwards um, a sort of tangible policy which integrates that understanding into into schools so that they do understand what they need to do maybe using this their own schools as a, as a good example of, of how it can be done well I, I think there's a lot of validity in that. I would, um, despite my accent, um, I live in Scotland and I represent a constituency in Scotland and we have uh, the Eco Schools Programme in Scotland, which is very good, not just for... And actually, my kids are at nursery and they do... One of my daughters, and it's not my fault, honestly, but she's the... I think she's on the Eco Committee of the nursery, which always strikes me as probably that's... Um, maybe that is where you should start with three- and four-year-olds. But, um, but the, it's not just about, um, you know, being wider awareness of wider environmental issues also the eco schools program is also about practical practical use within those schools and actually um in my own area in south lanarkshire we've had through the capital program not through private finance but almost every single one of 198 primary schools has been rebuilt and rebuilt to a much higher energy efficiency standard which is i think something which i think we could should be learned from i'm not familiar enough with what happens in england and wales as whether it's uh, whether it's as advanced, but it strikes me there's a huge opportunity and benefit there, which you know is is again going back to the previous question. It's not just all about 
building a big power station. It's the other things that need to happen alongside that and along with that to, uh, uh, to make these things as affordable as possible. I think the, the problem is in the, in the schools that e, the eco schools um, set up tends to be seen more of an after school activity. It needs to be more embedded within, within the curriculum essentially. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's, in Scotland it isn't, it is embedded within the curriculum. I'm not sure about, about England and man, that's something I can take up. Time for a couple more questions, I think. One here. Hello. Um, Henry Lawson from the Building Services Research and Information Association. One of the earlier questioners touched on um, local energy storage. I'd like to know what sort of role the panel think that energy storage should play on a larger scale and what are the types of technologies that they think need to be actively developed? Keith, do you want to start? Um, I think it depends on uh, what type of storage you're talking about. I think historically, um, Probably the best example of energy storage we have at the moment is the big pile of coal outside of the power station. And that's a pile of coal that will last for months and months if, if we need it to. Uh, replacing that is extremely difficult uh, if we're looking at that sort of seasonal storage. Um, I do believe though that storage can play an, uh, a, a much bigger role if we get down to within day um, and that, you know, the, 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 perhaps you know, just over a day, that's the sort of period of time probably that we can look realistically to economic storage solutions uh, bringing. Um, as much of a technical challenge, I think there's an economic challenge because to make storage work on, an, on energy, you need volatile prices regularly with a big swing. And I don't know whether highly volatile peaking prices um, is, is really the market that we're trying to create in order to encourage storage. And if storage is successful by its very nature, it will actually dampen down the very signals that it needs itself to keep going. So I think if we're going to do a lot, of more, a lot more with storage, we need to find a different model, uh, a different market or regulatory model to actually make it work in the power system. That's very different to batteries that, that you know, we've probably all got at least a couple of batteries in our pockets, but we're paying perhaps £100 per kilowatt hour, maybe £1,000 per kilowatt hour for, uh, for, the, um, uh, for, for that, and that's, that's fine for what it is that we're trying to do, but it isn't what would work in the power system. So I think there are big challenges for storage, and we need to differentiate what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, if, like the Americans, we're trying to find some batteries that will store the, the, the sun so that we can then use it in the evening, that's fine. If we've got sun uh, every day of the year, uh, at which a lot of the Americans have, or there are parts of the world that we have that. But in the UK, it will work during the day in the summer, uh, but we still then need something to fill the gap in the, in the winter when the sun's not shining so much. And that's a much, much bigger challenge. So it's a rather... Um, wide-ranging answer to the question, but I think it's important that we understand storage is not a technology or a thing. It is something with very, very different power requirements, very, very different durations, and the solutions will be quite different both technically and economically in, in order to drive those different solutions. In terms of t different technologies, there's a, a huge kind of list of various various types of things. I think the thing they all share in common is there isn't actually a, a clear market uh, and so consequently nobody's going to pay for them. But it's, it's one of those things. There's an awful lot of interest in um, investing in technology development and there's, there's things, there's, there's, I just wrote them down while Keith was talking, flywheels, pumped storage, there's batteries on a house level, batteries in electric cars, there's batteries, batteries on more larger centralised um, scales. There's press, pressurised air, there's converting electricity that's happening at the wrong time into, into say, hydrogen and injecting it into the gas grid. There's a really thermal storage things. There's all sorts of things. No, and there's no mechanism for actually rewarding people in developing them and actually building them. But it's something which everyone agrees is, needs to be done in order to have a more uh, operationally effective electricity supply industry. Any final questions? Take these two, one, one here. Uh, Mark Pollock, uh, planning consultant. 
Um, I just wondered, in view of uh, yesterday's UN report, uh, the latest report on climate change, um, what the panel's thoughts were in terms of trying to shift public opinion towards the need to perhaps pay more for energy so that we can secure a lower carbon uh, future, uh, given that this is a sustainability conference show. Uh, I think that's perhaps one of the key issues for the panel to, to consider, so interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's, it's absolutely key to, to get behavioural change going. Um, I think it's, it will be one of the key planks of the, the smart metering rollout is if you can actually introduce the energy efficiency argument at the point of install to, to infuse people. A question I'll, I'll put back to you, if you will, is go back to my petrol argument earlier. Why had people changed their habits in terms of the cars they buy and the cars they use? Is it because they're committed to saving carbon or is it because it was hitting them in the wallet? And I think it was probably the latter that you were hitting family budgets for the school run, for the weekly commute in their wallets and that's caused a behavioural change. And I think that's why I go back to the fact that we've actually got to look at explaining to people the cost behind this and really having this honest debate and that might then cause a behavioural change to actually be bought into properly by our consumers. What, what yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. I think that it has been driven uh, by the, um, the, the, the emission standard that was set for vehicles as well. Uh, and I think that's why it's important that we look at carrots and financial incentives at, alongside sticks, so regulatory mechanisms as well uh, to push that. The one point I would make, which I think is important, and I mentioned it right earlier on about the, um, the, the, the um, on, on capacity and who, who, who pays for capacity payments, and I think the distributional question about how, uh, who pays for this is really important because energy levies, by their nature, uh, put more of an onus on, the, on low earners than they do on high earners. So um, if we are paying for climate change, if we're paying for social change, if we're paying for investment only through energy bills, we're putting a disproportionate imp uh, uh, um, onus on the, the poor in society. And that's why I think it's really important that we have a much uh, more open debate on the distributional impacts of, of paying this. I don't disagree that it needs to be paid for and society needs to pay for it. But we need to find a means-tested way of doing that that means that, that those who can afford to pay are paying and not the other way around, which is exactly what happens at the moment with all these levies on, 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 on the bills. There was one question on here I was going to take, and that's all we've got time for. Sorry. Councillor Keith Kandark, I'm a Green Councillor in Warwickshire. What we actually need in terms of the capacity is actually to reduce the load in winter evenings, so yeah, 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock. And the one thing we can't seem to do is get decent funding for efficient lighting, street lighting. What they're doing is they're turning the street lights off after midnight and keeping all the old inefficient street lights still in place. So that's making the network even more peaky. Why can't we have the same amount of money to on mothball power plants put into better street lighting to be more efficient in the peak, which is actually where we need to be changing our grid? It is, it is something which I know in... Um in some places in um, in Glasgow, they're just about to start doing. I think they've um, fired the investment through the Green Investment Bank in terms of LED street lighting, and it's also happening. I think in other places in uh, that uh, that they're behind the you know helping to fund that transition, um, which has uh, makes a. I can't remember the figures now, but I was with um, people from Glasgow the other week talking about this and seeing what the impact in terms of both energy supply and cost to the local authority are. And there's a there's a, a re relatively easy win there, which is something which, um, uh, when I was talking to the Green Investment Bank about this the other week, was saying we want to really try and make sure one more local authorities are aware of that and the potential, and that's properly pushed out because that's a relatively simple way of being able to make a significant difference. And it is, it is starting to happen in some areas, but I agree with the thrust of the question it needs to be much more widespread. That's just about all we've got time for. Um, I think we've had a, a very wide-ranging um, discussion today. And what's, what's clear is that there are huge, huge challenges ahead, and ahead in a very short space of time as well, I think. Um, so I'm going to ask our panellists just to close out by, by saying, if, you, if there was one thing you could fix, one thing you could do tomorrow to fix the energy market, what would it be? Keith, I'm going to start with you. 
Um, keep it simple. Stop making everything so complicated. Fair enough, Gaynor. That's such a good answer. I want to adopt it for myself as well. And I have, I can't think think quite on my feet as quickly as, as Keith. And I'll come back at You'll the come end come if I've the end. thought of anything. <laughs> Okay, Tom. Um, I would say to make the market clear, fair and transparent so that people can understand exactly the parameters of this debate and therefore we can have a, an informed and objective debate rather than the one which we currently have, which is often skewed in different directions. Stable, affordable policy for about 25 years. <laughs> is that all? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. Okay, no. No, no, I just I think simplicity is the, the answer. At the moment, we're trying to sort of steer a steer a boat if, you, if you're a sailor and all the ropes are all tied up you know they, you pull one thing everything else budges it's just it needs to be simplified that certainly does that's all we've got time for please join me in thanking our panelists